Well, welcome to Peer Art Ministries and the Ignite Mentoring Series. My name is Robert Paris. I want to share with you the steps to entering the secret place with insight from Smith Wigglesworth. This is a very powerful message and it's, a, it's a really going to be a series if you don't mind. Several people have asked me regarding the secret place, could you give us practical steps on how to enter? And I'm going to try to do that, okay? But I'm going to try to build it upon a word foundation so that you get into the word and by the Holy Spirit get such a revelation because you need an experience where you have a real Jesus and have a real intimate relationship with Him. Many people think that once they get saved, that salvation speaks of when we go to heaven and, you know, living eternally with Jesus, which is wonderful, and that's true. But God desires that we live on this earth a life sold out to Him, that we recognize that we are no longer ours, but we're bought with a price, and that we abide in the secret place, so that we have a life there. And I want to share with some scriptures, but before I go there, let's just pray. Amen? Father, we just come in the name of Jesus. We come to the well. We come to drink today and receive all that you have for us. We desire to glorify you. And I thank you, Father, for a right word, a now word, a word that brings impact, a word that bears in our life the fruit that you desire. We thank you, Father God, that your precious Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see, ears to hear, and give us a hearing heart. Open the word to us. Let it be living. Let it be life to us. Let it bring revelation of Jesus and what he did on the cross. And that it let change us and transform us and bear fruit in us and through us, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. And so I want to start by sharing a few scriptures, if I may. Uh, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Of course, that's one of the foundational scriptures on which we're standing. Now, I want you to understand that in the Old Testament, they couldn't enter that secret place, which was the Holy of Holies. Why? Two things. One, there was a veil preventing you. Number two, the, only the high priest could enter once a year carrying the blood. And if he did not walk in there holy or right, he died. So this is a terrifying and holy place. But through the finished work of the cross, the veil was torn and God desires for you to come in that you might have fellowship with him. There is the outer court, there is the inner court, and there's the holy of holies. And many people hang around the outer court where they get that experience. Some come into the inner court where they discover the change and they discover the God who meets their needs and their whole focus is on their needs. There are then those that hear the call to come into the Holy of Holies where it is about a relationship and it's about a surrender. It's a glory place. It's a holy place. And I want to share some things here. So John 15, 1 and 3 says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Abide in me and I in you. A branch cannot bear fruit in and of itself <clears throat> uh, if it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. The call is that we need to understand that we need to have a daily abiding because the words used here, the tenses, are this ongoing, continual abiding in Him. Now, we think of salvation as something that when we get to heaven, enjoying eternal life. But God desires that while you're on this earth, that you would bear fruit, that you would bring Him glory. Otherwise, why not just take you home? But we're here because in every generation, somebody preached the gospel, bore fruit for Jesus. And so God wants us to enter into our inheritance, not just to hang out in the um, inner court and not to occasionally come in to the secret place, but to make it our permanent dwelling place. Now, let me give you one more verse. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. That in reference to your former self, which is being corrupted in accordance with with the lust of deceit, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness, holiness, and truth. And here he's speaking to believers. And so there's a choice and a decision we have to make every day. And I want to so disturb you and wreck you that when you get out of bed, you give yourself wholly unto God and you give him worship and you enter that secret place, which you're going to discover is not as much a place as a positioning. Because again, in the Old Testament, they couldn't enter in naturally, but you can enter in spiritually and you can experience that wonderful relationship with the Lord. Because remember, the temple's no longer there, but that secret place is available to all of us at any time, any place, if 
we learn how to enter in. So let me share some stuff with you. Smith said this, the reason the world is not seeing Jesus is that Christian people are not filled with Jesus. They are satisfied with attending meetings weekly, reading the Bible occasionally, and praying sometimes. It's an awful thing for me to see people who profess to be Christian, lifeless, powerless, and in a place where their lives are so parallel with unbelievers uh, that it's difficult to tell which place they're in, whether they're in the flesh or the spirit. And God desires you to be filled with life, not to just try to survive and make it through this life, but to walk as an overcomer and experience everything the Word has for you, to be filled with life. It's disturbing to me when I watch conferences or watch ministries preaching, and while they preach a nice inspirational word, there's no longer life, and there should be something that brings a change. And God wants you in the secret place because it is there where you have such an encounter with the life of the living God, and it changes you. It wrecks you. You are swallowed up in the love, and you come to a place where you're no longer a normal person, but an extraordinary person in Him. And you discover you're found in Him. Hallelujah. Let me continue. And it all starts with being born again. But I want to say this. There are two stages. The first stage is where God brings you out. Okay? And the second stage is He brings you in. And He brings you out of sin. And in Colossians 1.13, it says, He delivered us from the domain of darkness. And we also discover in 2 Corinthians 1.10, another verse. So God's brought you out. He, he brought you out of sin. He brought you out of your Egypt. And He wants to bring you in to that promised land, into your inheritance. And we'll talk more about that one later. But it starts with, you must be born again. Because in John 3.4, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you can't even see this thing. But when we read Romans chapter 8, we discover that when we are born again, we have the opportunity to come in and now live a life under the law of the Spirit of life. We walk by a different order. We walk by the Spirit man and not the natural. Amen? So Smith said this, Through faith, the eternal Word, um, by the operation of His Spirit, brings forth life in our hearts. And we realize we are living in a divine order where God is manifesting His power and living with us. And I want you to get a hold of that you build your life not upon circumstances, not upon experiences, not upon your feelings or hurts. You build your life upon the Word of God. And the first step in entering is that, of course, we must be born again. And your experience being born again is not based on how you feel. It's based on the authority of the Word. Amen? And so everything points to the authority of the Word. And I come and I receive salvation through what Jesus did on the cross. The secret place, you come in and, and it's, of course, covered with the blood. And everything points to what Jesus did on the cross. And so I have to have a full revelation and understanding by the Spirit of what Jesus did for me on the cross. And it must be applied by faith in my life. Smith said this, There have been times when there seems to be a stone wall in front of us. There are times when there are no feelings. There are times when everything seems as black as midnight. And there's nothing left but confidence in God. What you must do is have the devotion and confidence to believe that He will not fail and cannot fail. You will never get anywhere if you depend on your feelings. There is something a thousand times better than feelings, and it is the powerful Word of God. There is divine revelation within you that came when you were born from above, and that is real faith. To be born into the new kingdom is to be born into a new faith. And in the secret place, as you enter in, I want to so encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to open the Word. I encourage you that before you even open this Bible, that you pray over it like you pray over your food, and let the Holy Spirit open your eyes, see, ears to hear. Because you want a revelation, you want a, a relationship with the Lord through the Word. And allow the Word to come in and produce the impact that it's supposed to, and the fruit that it's supposed to, because it's living, and it's creative, and as it gets in you, it will do what it's supposed to do, and it will create, and it will produce life in you and through you. And God wants you alive, and I've said that many times, and I'll keep saying that. God wants you so filled with the abundant life. Amen? Now, but there must be a holy desperation in you. That's number two, okay? So the second step, which is based upon Hebrews eleven six, and without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that comes to God must first believe that he is, and he is the rewarder 
of those that diligently seek Him. And so there has to be a desire in you that, God, I want to know you. I don't want to be satisfied with just experiencing God that I know about who meets my needs, who does this for me, that for me. I want to know you. I want to have a real relationship with you. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm desperate for more of you. I'm not satisfied. I may be content, God, where I am today, but I'm not satisfied. I've got to have more of you. And we've got to not say that. We've got to mean it. And as a consequence, we press in. And Smith said, I pray that there may be within us a deep hunger and thirst with all penetration, which is centered upon the axle of him, for surely he is all in all. And that's where he must become. He must become your all in all. Your life must change so that we no longer live trying to survive life, but we live focused on him. That we now live a new life. We're bought with a price. We're no longer our own. But everything points at focuses on him. We get out of bed and he's our first thought. We go after him. Our life centers around him. Now I realize we've got jobs to do, this to do, but now the focus, the axle, everything is around him because we want to be real. And so that desperation goes after him. You know, we live in a world where, you know, if you like someone, love someone, whatever, you have the phone, you can text them at any time. We, we, we do. And now, because he's our own all, we take time. I mean, it may be just a five second, God, I just love you. He becomes your all in all. And there's a desperation that grows in you that God, I'm coming after because I want to know you. Mm, hallelujah. Smith said, seek the Lord and he will sanctify every thought, every act. So your whole being is ablaze with holy purity and your one desire will be for him who has created you in holiness. Because I want you to get this, that God put in your spirit, man, a need for fellowship. And many people backslide and fall because they did not develop that intimate fellowship that your spirit man was created for. So you need the secret place because you need that relationship with him because out of that comes the life that your spirit man so desperately needs. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful thing when God gets you. You are not much good for anything until God gets you. And you're going to discover that as a consequence of the secret place, you become something of a great blessing to this generation, something of great value and worth. Hallelujah. But we must become broken first. And this is something we don't like. But this step is so important. But let me explain it to you. In Matthew 5, 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Theirs is, present tense, through that poverty of spirit, and recognizing who I really am and allowing, as we're going to discover as we go into the secret place, I see the blood. I see the price that he paid for me and it has to have an impact. It's real. See, many of us have heard about the cross and we had that encounter where we got saved. But now it's real. It's becoming more real. I look upon as I go in the Holy of Holies. I see the blood and it breaks me. I see the nail pierced feet and the hands. And I see how he paid the price for me. It's real. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's not group thing. This is a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the living God and what he did for you. And that's the first step because he's bringing you out and he wants you aware of what he did for you and how precious you are. That he chased you, he chased, went after you. He left the 99 that he might find you and he paid a price to redeem you. Hallelujah. And so in, in Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And there's something, you know, we go through a period of brokenness and it's, it's a difficult season. But if we could understand how in that place and we cry out to God, it's a glorious opportunity because it's a sacrifice that is pleasing God to come in and go after him because he's the only one that can truly minister to you. See, we got to realize in this life, how lacking we are, how naked we are, how we cannot do it in ourselves. We've got to be broken of us. And it's often in those bad, difficult seasons where we cannot. And it's hard, it's difficult, we realize just how lacking we are. But in that place of brokenness, as we look to Him, we see that He paid the price and that He sees us as precious. And He comes not to sympathize, 
but to comfort, to strengthen, to build up. And he's saying, come into the secret places because that's where you need to be. That's the place where I can embrace you, hold you, strengthen you, speak to you, talk to you, and minister to you. That's the place of change. So don't linger in the outer court. Don't just hang out in the inner court, but come to the one and one with him. Smith said this, it is when you cease to clothe ourselves that God clothes us. And it is clothing wherewith he clothes us that covers our nakedness. See, we put on our ability because we're trying to survive life. We're trained to do things a certain way, to somehow make it through to the next day, to take care of ourselves uh, and survival of the fittest. But we walk according to Romans 8, a new law, the law of the spirit and life. And it is here where my focus is no longer on surviving, but living in him. And that living comes as I lay down my life, unless the seed falls into the ground and dies. Unless I take up my cross daily and follow him. Unless I recognize that it is, I must die first in order for a resurrection to come, in order for glorification to come. And I know that most people want to preach this message, but this is the message that brings you to life and to something real, so that you're found in him. Because I don't want an inspirational, fluffy message that makes me feel good, that appeals to me emotionally, but does nothing for me spiritually, and doesn't build in me strength for the storm, build in me ability to stand and take ground and see my loved ones touched and changed and brought to the Lord Jesus. Smith said this regarding Paul and his conversion. Well, Paul had to first come to this time of crying, weeping, contrition, Help us, our heart meltness, yieldedness. He had done all he could in the natural, but the natural had only brought him to a broken place. And we come to this place where you cannot in and of yourself do it. And this is a place of brokenness where I realize that I cannot make it happen anymore. But I have to trust in him. And it's an absolute confidence and trust in him. So I come because he's the rewarder. And I come to the one, only one, who can truly minister, who's the only one that's going to get me out of this. See, we've always had our safety net. We could turn to this or turn to that. But there comes a day where God shuts them all down and says, it's you and me. And there's a call to come into the secret place and discover the good father who gives good gifts, who's a really, really good, loving daddy God. Mm. Smith said this regarding his own life. Of course, Smith Wigglesworth, and you can watch the documentaries I've done on him, was a man so utterly changed by the Spirit that he would not preach beforehand. And he lived in Yorkshire, didn't have a great, he had a good ministry of healing, but he didn't preach. He refused to preach because he couldn't speak well, he couldn't read right. But he's so utterly changed by the Spirit of God, this nobody became a somebody that God took worldwide. And I look at every great hero of faith, and I'll share with stories of other heroes of faith, and how they got in. They were nobodies, but God made them somebodies in the secret place, in that place of surrender, that they could now live and abide in that place. So no matter what they faced, God was with them. They were under the shadow of the Most High, and all the promises of Psalm 91 were now theirs, now theirs. Amen? You get to understand? Now theirs. Not something that maybe, but were now theirs. Now let me continue. Unless God brings us to a place of brokenness of spirit, unless God remolds us into the great plan of his will for us, the best for us shall utterly fail. But when we are absolutely taken in hand by the Almighty God, God makes even the weakness strength. And so God takes us in this place and every area of weakness where we look at that my best won't work. I look at, you know, I start to see the impact of life's been touched and changed by this ministry and it's beyond me and people coming for ministry say god i don't have it and so i have to pray and go after him because it's that place of surrender and desperation for him that i recognize i need what he has otherwise i don't have it i cannot spend the time carefully skillfully working on a message anymore because that doesn't produce the real life that you need and I want you to get that whatever you're facing, no matter what you're going through, you can do it certain ways, find certain laws, you know, the laws of success. If you do this, 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 or you can come into the secret place and in that place of brokenness where you recognize you cannot do it. There is something that changes in you. 
and that area of weakness becomes strong and he's now able to bring you to the place of his perfect will. I'm tired of walking in his permissive will and I want his perfect will by abiding permanently through a relationship with him through the word, something that's living. But I've got to surrender. And that brokenness talks of my opinions, my thoughts, all those things that I would raise up, my hurts, my memories, me, I've got to be hurt. You got to hear what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking. Well, God knows what you think. He knows what you feel. He knows your hurts. And he's saying to you, you've got to lay them down. Because Jesus, you look at the price he paid and how he utterly surrendered, walked humbly for you. He didn't need it to do it for himself. But that life of absolute obedience and surrender and saying, God, I choose your will. I will drink of this cup, not for himself, but for you and me. And that the call is that we come because he is such a good father. He says, look, unless you give it to me, I can't heal you. And it's like the child with the splinter in their finger. Unless you give me that finger and allow me to work on it and remove the splinter, it will remain hurting and it will get worse as it festers. And there's things in your life, unless you surrender, they fester and they get worse. And God wants you free today from it through that place of brokenness of saying, God, I give it to you. I can't carry this anymore. I can't do this anymore. Hallelujah. He said, many things may happen in our lives to show us how depraved we have been by nature. But when the veil is lifted, we see how much merciful and tenderful God is. His tender compassion is over us all the time. And because of what we've been going through and because they've become greater in our lives, we've not seen how wonderful His mercy has been, how He's kept us, how He's watched over us, and how things could have been so much worse. But He always steps in and delivers us because He's faithful. He is a good father and he cares for you. But if you can remove this stuff, not only will you get the revelation how good he's been, you step into a place where you now go into the abundance of his mercy and you can really receive all he has for you. Smith said, God means to have a people who are broken. The divine power can only come when there's an end of our own self-sufficiency. But when we are broken, we must hold fast. If we let go, we shall fall short. And you've got to hold on. You've got to cling to the Lord God in this place. Say, God, I've got to have you. I am desperate for you. I recognize in this place. And this is what brings me to brokenness because I see everything. I see Jesus. I see the price he paid. I see his great love for me. I see his faithfulness. And I look at me and my abilities and how they fall short. I look at me and I'm reminded of all the things that I did. How stupid I've been. And how foolish I've been. And I'm broken. And I had to lay all of that at his feet and let it go. All my hurts, my disappointments, my discouragements, my frustrations, all those things. And every day come and I have to lay it at his feet and say, God, I let it go. It, is, it doesn't belong to me. I'm a new creation and I put on Jesus. Romans 13, 14. I put on. I put on this new life. Amen. In Ephesians 4, I'm putting on. I lay off the old and I put on the new. Smith said there is a place where God will show up. You must come to a place of ashes, a place of helplessness, a place of wholehearted surrender where you do not refer to yourself. You have no justification of your own in regard to anything. You are prepared to be slandered, you to be despised by everybody. But because of his personality in you, he reserved you for himself because you are godly. And he set you in high because you have known his name, Psalm 91 14. He causes you to be fruit of his loins and to bring forth his glory so that you will no longer rest in yourself. Your confidence will be in God. Ah, it is lovely. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3 17. And God wants to bring you to a place where the precious promises are not just things you think about. And not just precious promises you put on the wall, but they're now your inheritance. And they're living their fire in you. And they're bringing change. And they're real. And you have a breakthrough in God. And you can stand and you can know. And you can take on and challenge your circumstances and command them to bow. But first we must bow. First we must come to an end. And every opinion, every thought, everything in us, all the stubbornness and all everything must come. And at the cross must bow and must be broken at the cross and given and surrendered under his mighty hand. We must yield to the word of God. The word will work out love in our hearts 
And when practical love is in our hearts, there is no room to boast but ourselves. We see ourselves as nothing when we get lost in divine love. And yet we see ourselves as everything because we get a full revelation of who we are. And we no longer boast in ourselves. I don't need me too. I don't need to look and defend myself. I have such a love bestowed on me by the Father. I'm so kept by Him. I don't care if people slander me, come against me. I am secure in Him. And that's my desire for you. My worth is not found in things or in the response of people or in anything else but Him. My worth comes from Him. And I want you to get a hold of that, that your worth comes from Him and nothing else. Let me continue. Because we must be transformed. This is the fifth step. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Smith said this, We are occupied too much with things of time and sense. We need to spend time alone in the presence of God. We need to give God much time in order to receive new revelation from Him. We need to get past all the thoughts of earthly matters that crowd in so rapidly. And so there has to be this place of surrender where the noise, the noise of life, your circumstances, the noise of you, of your opinions, your thoughts, and all the things must bow. There is a perfect peace in Him. There is no pressure in Him. There is no pushing on Him. But rather, He's a perfect gentleman and He draws you in. The God who just doesn't abide in time draws you into this wonderful place where there's a peace, where there's nothing missing, nothing lacking, and you are complete in Him. And you can trust He's able to redeem the time. He's able to work all things for your good in this wonderful place of surrender in this wonderful place because there's a transforming. But I have to give over because it's a place of exchange. If you are going to go forward, if you're going to walk now in the secret place, you cannot bring in your burdens. You cannot bring in yourself. Why? That veil is reformed. That veil always speaks of the cross. And so your boast is no longer in you, but in the cross. It is in the finished work of the cross, what Jesus did. And I, everything I do must lift him up. Everything in the secret place points to Jesus and what he did. His mercy, the angels, the cherubim bow, honoring the cross. And so that secret place, to abide and dwell in it, you must live a life where every part of your being honors the cross. Everything is brought captive, every thought, every stronghold brought captive to honor Jesus and honor the cross. Amen? Mm, hallelujah. Smith said this regarding Jacob. He knew that he'd been a disappointment to the Lord, that he had been a groveler, but in the revelation he received that night where he wrestled with the Lord, okay, he saw the possibility of being transformed from a supplanter to the prince with God. And God wants to lift you up, Psalm 113, and not just lift you up, but make you princes, to make you sons and daughters, kings and priests, to be more than conquerors. So God wants to, again, we'll share about this next time, He takes you out to bring you into something. But there has to be an exchange. There has to be a letting go. You cannot step into the next area of being brought in until we let go of all the baggage that we've been carrying with us. All the stuff that has hindered us, all the stuff that has held us captive, that doesn't belong to us. And He wants to set us free, and He wants to put on you new robes. Hallelujah. All the blessedness of being brought into a life of dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Henceforth, we know that we are nothing without Him. We are absolutely dependent upon Him, and absolutely nothing without the power and unction of the Holy Ghost. But I have the Holy Ghost, and that secret place now I have, and you can walk full. You can walk with that unction anointing no matter what you face. I'm no longer praying over God bless this, but I walk blessed. Let me share this. It is those who have seen the face of God and who have been broken by Him who can meet the forces of the enemy and break down the bulwarks of Satan's kingdom. And many of us have prayed and we wonder why things are not broken because the enemy had a stronghold in us. And we have to first be broken and brought to the end of us. And so there is no, nothing of the enemy in me. And I am fully, completely sold out, given to the Lord. And He has access to every part of my life. I go back to the fall where Adam and Eve had to cover up certain areas. And we cover up all those hurts, all those areas we protect. 
But now in the secret place, I open and say, God, you have access. I surrender. I yield and allow you to change me, to transform me. I desire that. I recognize I need that change by your spirit. Smith said this, let him change and transform you. Never let him go until he blesses you until he makes you an Israel, a prince with God. And you want to hold fast until you're changed. You cannot earn this, and you cannot make it happen. You come by faith, okay? You don't come, and I want you to get a hold of that. We walk by faith and not by our circumstances, or how we feel, or how we see. You stand by faith, and the entrance in is not by works. It is by grace. And I come because of what Jesus did. And my confidence is based on what Jesus did, not on me, not on my abilities, not on my earning it. So if I'm praying longer, it's going after Him. It's not to earn Him. If I'm fasting, it's not to earn. It is an obedience thing, and it's a worship of Him. So that now my desire is set on Him, and I'm just going after Him. I'm clinging to Him. How many people, if you're in a relationship, you know, oh, I spent five hours with you, I earned something. You spend five hours with somebody because you want to spend five hours. There's a love thing. There's a desire. And you don't think of the time. You just go after the person. And it's the same thing with the Lord. I come not trying to feel or trying to earn it. I come because I so love you. I'm so desperate for you. And I come based on what you did, Jesus, in such an awe. It's breaking me. It's changing me. And I want to be transformed. I just want to know you and be known by you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I pray you're getting something out of this. We will do a follow-up part two, because there's so much we could share. Check out some other videos on The Secret Place, and may they inspire and encourage you. I ask you to subscribe and like and share. We're having such an impact on so many lives. And as you like and subscribe, you enable us and help us through the Google algorithms to reach more people. And I want to see more backsliders one back. I want more believers walking with the life and a real relationship with Jesus. Amen. I'm also going to say this. If anybody asks for money, um, in a comment or whatever way, they're scammers. Pray for them, but ignore them because we do not ask for money. Amen. Now, I encourage you also to join our prayer partnership team. It's free. If the Lord puts it in your heart and you want to share with us, you want to financially help us, great. But you don't have to to be part of the prayer partnership team. And we don't ask for money there either. Because I want you to receive the reward of the lives touched and changed as you gather together with us and help us. You know, as we stand together as one, there's power in it. And you can receive the reward on this earth of having people praying for you when you need it the most. Hallelujah. And you can be praying for others. I want you to know that we're praying for you, be praying for us. Be encouraged and be living boldly for Jesus, filled with His Holy Spirit, abiding permanently in the secret place. That's your inheritance. Thank you for watching and check out more in the series. May they bless you and inspire you, encourage you and provoke you in the name of Jesus. Amen.